that women are scoring slightly higher than men in terms of their self-reported empathy. What do we know about the brain basis of empathy and um, differences in the brain when a person with autism is empathizing? Well, we certainly know that the amygdala is one key region which uh, is involved in empathy. And we know this, for example, from the work of Jean de Setti, um, who has studied typical individuals, but also those with conduct disorder or antisocial personality traits. Uh, and what we see here is functional MRI, where the individual is in the scanner looking at uh, images of somebody playing the piano, but then where the lid of the piano is slammed down on the fingers of the, of the pianist. What we see in the typical individual is that the amygdala is very active when they're seeing somebody else in pain, when they're recognizing another person's mental state. Interestingly, in the group of children with conduct disorder, there's a different kind of abnormality, which is that they also showed, uh, bel not, they showed below average uh, level of activity in the, in the amygdala, but they showed increased activity in the ventral striatum, which is associated with reward. So in that clinical group, whilst they recognized, well, that whilst they were uh, watching somebody else in pain, they were also getting some level of reward uh, in seeing somebody else suffer. But we know that people with autism are different to people with conduct disorder or antisocial personality in that they show the empathy deficits but without that pleasure at somebody else's pain. The amygdala is not the only structure involved in empathy. And my reading of the literature is actually that there are at least 10 different brain regions involved in empathy. So we can think of empathy as not located in one part of the brain, but as part of a, a network or a circuit, what we could call the empathy circuit. And uh, without going through all of these regions, I'll simply pick out the ventromedial prefrontal cortex has been, um, has been demonstrated in many studies to be involved in appreciating other people's states of mind. I've mentioned the amygdala already, but the right temporal parietal junction, the RTPJ, is also consistently being identified. Each of these brain regions uh, seems to be involved in different aspects of empathy, and you can see just some of these listed here. So um, some of them are involved in what we think of as theory of mind or inferring another person's thoughts and feelings. Some of them much more focused on looking at the face and looking at eyes in particular. Some of them involved in um, what Rizzolatti was describing as mirror neurons. But together they all seem to be involved in what we're calling this umbrella term of empathy. And in many different studies, people on the autistic spectrum show underactivity in uh, one or more of these regions. And you can see them um, shown here, these 10 different regions. So you can see the amygdala shown uh, from underneath over there, um, the right temporal parietal, temporal parietal junction, RTPJ, um, and the ventromedial prefrontal cortex picked out over there. That's telling us about brain activity um, associated with empathy, but is it possible that, um, that hormones also play a role in the development of individual differences in empathy. We've been looking at sex steroid hormones, particularly testosterone, um, measured during pregnancy in the amniotic fluid to try to understand why we see consistent sex differences in empathy. Why, across many of these studies, are women or girls performing at a higher level than men or boys on different tests of, uh, of empathy. And given that testosterone, a sex steroid hormone, 
has been shown from animal research to be involved in brain development, in masculinization of the brain, um, and that boys produce twice as much of this hormone as girls. We've been measuring it um, in women who have amniocentesis during pregnancy. So for clinical reasons, um, some of the fluid surrounding the fetus is sampled from, uh, from here using a long needle, and we've been asking the mothers for their consent to analyze that fluid for testosterone levels, the testosterone produced by the fetus, and then waiting till the child is born to look to see if there's any correlation with later empathy. And what you see here is that these children are now eight years old, so it's a longitudinal study, and we can give them that test of empathy, the reading the mind in the eyes test, and we find this negative correlation, or inverse correlation, so the line is sloping down. Uh, so here we've got testosterone level, and here we've got your score on the eyes test, and what this is telling us is that in typically developing children, even after you control for social variables like the number of siblings, birth order, parental education, um, there's a, a, a significant inverse correlation. The higher your fetal testosterone, the more difficulty you have in reading emotions from another person's face. And interestingly, we see the same um, pattern of results when we ask the mother to fill in the child empathy quotient, the EQ, about her child. So she's uh, filling in uh, statements like this or agreeing or disagreeing with statements like this. And we see the same inverse correlation that the higher the child's fetal testosterone, the lower their score eight years later on this empathy quotient. And of course, these measures are entirely blind um, with respect to how they're collected and um, that the biochemist is looking at the hormone levels, the mother is filling in the questionnaire, so they're done independently. But when you put the data together, you find a significant inverse correlation. We've also looked to see whether there are any genetic correlates of empathy, of where you are on this empathy dimension. And what you see here is that we've been studying, amongst other candidate genes, genes involved in the sex steroids, um, in the production of testosterone uh, or estrogen, or in the receptors for, that, for, those, for those hormones. And uh, here we see 10 genes that are involved in the regulation of sex steroid hormones, which correlate either with your, sorry, let me just go back, either with your EQ score, if you're in the general population, or your autism spectrum quotient score, so the number of autistic traits, or indeed in a case control design with whether you have a diagnosis or not of Asperger's syndrome. And um, these are all showing nominal significance, that's to say at the 0.05 level, but if you then conduct permutation testing to control for multiple comparisons, uh, you find that three of these sex steroid genes remain significant even after permutation testing. And these genes are interesting because one of them you can see here is the estrogen receptor gene, um, ESR2, on chromosome 14. This one here, CYP11B1, is on chromosome 8Q and it's uh, got a mutation in people with congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So these are individuals who, um, for genetic reasons, are overproducing testosterone. And in a separate study, we found that girls with this condition have higher than average number of autistic traits. I want to quickly mention systemizing as the other part of this um, two-factor model because uh, we've been trying to test uh, whether people on the autistic spectrum um, have got either intact or even above average systemizing. So this is a little physics test, um, going back to spinning plates, where to test whether people can see the patterns. 
in systems. This is a mechanical system. Uh, we've given it to children with Asperger's syndrome. Um, and you can see here that you have to uh, look at the wheel rotating anti-clockwise and predict what this point P will do. And the correct answer is it will move back and forth. And you can see that children with Asperger's syndrome actually perform higher than a control group. Um, and interestingly here, the children with Asperger's syndrome were younger than the typical controls, but were scoring at a higher level. So they're showing precocious understanding of systems. This is also a task which in the general population we also see sex differences on, with males scoring higher than females on these tests of understanding mechanics. Some people think that um, systemizing may be secondary to excellent attention to detail, and this is a task that many of you will have seen, uh, the embedded figures test, because when you systemize, you have to pay attention to the small details, whether it's, in a, in, it, whether it's a variable in a machine or a number in an equation. Missing one of those details will mean you don't understand how that system works. And what we see here is that people on the autistic spectrum, on the adult embedded figures test, are faster than typical men and women in the adult population. This is the average number of seconds to find the target shape hidden in the overall design. And this has also been found on the child version of the same test. Once again, we're seeing sex differences in attention to detail um, uh, on these sorts of tasks. We can use questionnaires to assess systemizing. This is the systemizing quotient. And it's got the same format as the empathy questionnaire, um, where you agree or disagree with each statement as a description of you. Uh, for adults who can fill these in by self-report, we see that adults with Asperger's syndrome score much higher or significantly higher than typical men and women in the population, suggesting they have even stronger interests in systems, here a mechanical system, a second example being an electrical system, uh, and with men scoring significantly higher than women in terms of their self-reported interest in systems. There's a parent version of the same questionnaire um, showing exactly the same pattern of results, namely that children with Asperger's syndrome or autism are rated as having stronger interest in systems compared to um, the ch typically developing children um, when the questionnaire is filled out uh, by the parent. And this idea that systemizing may be an important part of the autistic spectrum is evident when we look at the first or second degree relatives of people with an autism diagnosis. This is an old study where we looked at occupations of fathers and grandfathers of children with autism, uh, comparing them to children with Down syndrome, a different developmental condition, just in terms of the percentage of fathers and grandfathers working in the field of engineering.